it's a translation it's a different language and the physical felt sense i can't always find words or similes or visuals suggestions that work to get that idea over um and i have to be okay with the imperfectness of that I'm here with Catherine Annis and um, God, Catherine and I go back quite some time. I think we'd known of each other before we met each other. And um, from my memory, I think the first time we actually met was in King's Cross Studios where I was running those series of evening sessions. And that was, I've, I think I've used every single room in King's Cross Studios over my sort of almost 20 years of being there. And this was in the basement room, I'll never forget that. And you were sitting at the back, that's right. In that in quite a small room, but I was running those minuscule little anatomy workshops for people within within the field of movement, really. And um, I think from that moment, we just started to develop a, a friendship. You know, we built our relationship around our work from there, and from there on in, it's actually just grown. And I, I love working with you and love teaching with you. And other than that, we've got to know each other as good friends as well. So um, mm. I'd like to welcome Catherine Annis. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gary, for reminding me about that all those years ago. Yeah, I remember we were rolling around on the carpet. Um, and not just us two, it was a lot of other people. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, not just the two of us. Um, but yeah, I do remember that. Uh, I'd never, I don't think I'd ever been there before. It's a really lovely space. Yeah, and um, it's still there, you know, mm. it's still going. Um, although the guy that owns it doesn't exist anymore. He died, unfortunately, and um, but the place is still running. Good to know. Um, Catherine, how did you get into the work that you're doing now? You know, what kind of, what sort of route got you to this understanding? Because we're both influenced heavily by the work of Van der Scarabelli, and I think we've, we've kind of got our own take on that. We've, Brought, we've both got a similar interest in the anatomy in different ways and you know, how did all this come about for you? Yeah, that's a good question, isn't it? I mean, one of my teacher trainees was asking me a similar kind of question the other day and it's a long story. I mean, and I won't bore you with it all, but um, I suppose I've always done I've always been involved with movement since I was little because I started dancing when I was about five or six. And then I started yoga with my mom when I was about 12. Um, it used to be keep fit in those days. And then it turned into yoga, you know, in church halls where you had to wear thermals and keep warm and you weren't allowed to do any omming because it was seen as fruit of the devil. Um, I remember that. Anyway, uh, so yoga then, and then through various different teachers where I was at the time, and then I went to this class in what was called Holmes Place back in the 80s, would it have been? Holmes Place, yeah. Holmes Place, and there was this great teacher there. And I don't know if you, you, I'm pretty sure you might know her, Alex, Alex Gray. The name rings a bell, I've not. Yeah, she was fantastic. And she, she really was asking us to do stuff that stopped me doing what I habitually would do, which was to go right into the end range of my flexibility and be sort of dancery about it. And she was amazing, it was fantastic. And it turned out, that she had been working with Vanda. I think she met Vanda once. And then she worked with Diane Long. And through that connection, I got introduced to John Sturk. And people who know me know that I've worked with John since then. So uh, a few years now. <laughs> um, and he really got to me because he, 
he showed me that my interest in the anatomy, which was already there, could come to life through the body. It wasn't just, you know, which bit joins to what. It was, can you feel the pathways? Can you go in? Um, and can you trace something that is going to produce a different kind of movement, a different kind of approach other than, okay, and now we will do trikonasana and we will make this shape. So that's the potted version. Yeah. <laughs> um, because um, <clears throat> I, I interviewed John as well on, on these sessions and um, I had to thank him for the, the course of events that happened from the moment of meeting him because it changed everything that I did. Mm -hmm. Same with meeting Peter Blackaby as well. Um, and I remember the first time I ever I worked with John in a workshop and it was almost halfway through that workshop I remember thinking this is incredible I've gone so deep into something I've got no idea what it is but what I now know about anatomy and what I thought I knew has been thrown up into the air and what do I do with it all now and it gave me the place where I could just rest back into it and almost collapse <laughs> and let everything go and allow something else to take place quite profound i think it's it's um it is mind altering mm -hmm. um you know i've i've come out of sessions with john and he feels like i've taken something i look up at the moon and i end up taking endless photographs of the moon with my phone you know which are all terrible but at the moment at that moment i'm so kind of spaced out on breath and fabric of tissue and inner movement and wherever else we've been quite often to the bottom of a pond or on a beach or in some indian ashram you know he's never been to india but he knows all about how indian ashrams seem to work um, and it it just working that deeply that intensively and with that much focus changes you yeah for the better yeah, absolutely i mean i mean i know you know this is it changes the practice as well i mean you can no longer teach in the way that we might have taught before you know and no longer move the way we probably moved before and it's that's a strange place to be for a while because you know the fabric of what we've ever known has been peeled apart and then we're left with something i don't know raw and he uses the word primal quite a lot um and it is because it comes up it's like if you if you give yourself to it it um it takes over mm -hmm. i mean vanda said this didn't she it will pull you up um and it becomes much more absorbing much more um nourishing than what i was doing before i met john and yeah. i remember he he asked me he said why do you want to come to me because i phoned him up and i said john please can i come to your class why do you want to come to me and i had to persuade him that i was looking for something that would take me deeper mm. what do you mean deeper what do you mean and um sort of have to fumble around and try and find the words for something that I hadn't felt and I didn't know existed but I just felt I imagined that there must be something that was pulling people back into yoga because so many people were talking about it and I'd been doing it for so long but I I could feel that I was missing something mm. and and he for me he was the key um, from from that I mean you've developed <clears throat> you've developed your work your teaching your way and you know it's the same i think it's the same with all of us that's, they've been influenced by that work the same with people like john and sophie diane and whoever that when when you see everyone they've come from the same root and yet the the practices are, are quite different you know if you look at someone like diane long and john sturt they're kind of opposite ends of the same tree mm come from that route but found their own way to express something and then you know i think what it's done is it's allowed the individual to do what vanda probably would have wished was to find her own way yeah i, I think that's absolutely how it is i mean because we all 
develop out of our own movement practices and our own histories and we've done different things i mean you've done cycling and bodybuilding and i've done dance and pilates and yeah that's mm -hmm. about it really <laughs> bit of yoga here and there mm -hmm. and you know it develops you in different ways you have different structures you have different texture of tissue and a different psychological approach and so inevitably what you end up doing is going to follow if you're true to it if you're really listening into yourself it's going to follow through the tissues and the grain of you um and that's what i'm really interested in at the moment is and I'm finding it very difficult. Guys who are coming to my classes at the moment, they know that I keep fumbling over my words and there's interminable spaces because I'm finding it really difficult to describe the kind of, the moving through the miasma of the tissues inside. It feels like I'm scuba diving or flying, but without any visible support. Yeah. It's <laughs> bad analogy, not working, but no, I'm, I'm with you fully because, <clears throat> I mean, you and I have both spoken about this because, you know, I've, been, I've been always enjoyed teaching with you and alongside you and, you know, we've done quite a few things together, and especially at that yoga show thing as well, <laughs> that we, is that, you know, we, we dance in and out with the language and I, I, I can see the two of us sometimes having to work really hard to find a language to describe this work as we're going through it at the same time, because we almost have to be in the feeling mm. to then put the words across, because it's none of it's instructional. <laughs> no, because John said a while ago, ages ago, in fact, he said, you know, there are two kinds of teachers. There are the teachers that tell you what to do. So lift up your arm, bring the other arm around, stretch, or whatever it is you're doing. And there are the other teachers that tell you how to do it. So they'll make you, you know, give you a suggestion of a shape and then give you other suggestions about what might be happening inside so that there's no kind of end shape that is correct. And I think that's really difficult for people to grasp. And it's difficult to teach because I can teach you trikonasana, no problem. You can teach me downward dog, easy peasy lemon squeezy, but to give each other something else to chew on, to explore into that's going to give it that mind altering kind of lushness mm. is a whole other story. And you know, we can go into kind of floral language, fine, no problem, but that can be a turn off for some people. So how do you, you know, how, how do you get there? Yeah. I mean, have, from your perspective then, I mean, because I know you've taught at quite major centres in London and you've, you know, you, you've built a really good reputation for yourself. That reputation has gone far and wide. Um, but do you find that there's a difference in maybe the kind of clientele that you're working with in those environments to how it might be further afield? Hmm. Um, it's interesting. When I work at um, Tri Yoga, because they have such a huge footfall and people tend to come to Tri Yoga because of Tri Yoga's reputation, for providing great studio space and good teachers. Um, they may, my perception is that people will come and they'll try a whole load of different classes and they'll see what fits for them. So I get exposed to different students there. And the people who seem to stick are the people who are interested in doing something a bit wacky, maybe, um, a bit, less kind of structured um who are happy to crawl around on the floor with me for a bit maybe slither around like a lizard or explore drifting in space or whatever it is that i'm doing that time but that kind of that kind of student that kind of person who's looking for that kind of movement experience 
is the same whether they are in Tri-Yoga or in the wilds in where I am now, Exmoor. Okay. Same kind of person, people who are just looking for that, that kind of slightly slower, slightly more, for me it's provocative. Mm. In, in the way that it provokes me to sometimes the yoga feels like I'm doing this to myself, giving myself a good poke and say, wake up, you know, come on into this bit of you. That's not quite awake today and move in there. You know, that's, that's really a great way to describe that. I think Catherine is that, you know, that there, there is, it's, cause I don't think, you know, this, this works sometimes a bit like Marmite, you know, <laughs> You're either going to like it or hate it, you know, one way or the other. And, um, or some people find that they've tried it out and then three or four years later they come back because something stays there and they realize that something's not fulfilling them. And there's something in this work, even though I find it hard to describe that, is that, as you said, it, 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 it can wake up areas without making that instructional once again. It's, you know, we, we see out there so often is that there's these recipes for movement. So, you know, if you've got this issue, do these things. But, I, I, you know, this doesn't do that. And a lot of people think that it does mm. in, in a recipe type way. But there isn't the same recipe. Each person's so individual. <laughs> it's really interesting. I did, a, I did a workshop on feet recently. And one of my teacher trainees was at that workshop. And he wrote me this email the other day. He goes, Catherine, when you were talking about the foot, should I be doing this? Should I be pulling up? Should I be focusing on the tibialis? Should I be focusing on the inside of the foot? How do I make my heel longer? And he created this whole load of different questions. And I read it and he's a bit like that. He, he's fantastic. I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying. He sends me all these emails with these different questions in. Um, which are great questions. And I wrote back to him and I said, I know you're going to hate me for this, but the answer is, if it feels good, do it. <laughs> and um, because I think that's what I'm trying to do all the time in my practice is not go into something because it's familiar, but go into something because it feels like it's new territory go into something because maybe it's the opposite of what I did yesterday mm. and see what happens. And of course, along that journey, if it doesn't feel good, I'm not going to pursue it. And it might not be that it feels easy. It might feel difficult, but I can, you know, you know, if you do something that feels difficult, but it feels worthwhile, then it's okay, isn't it? You're going to continue with that maybe unless you're really knackered in which case you probably just chill out and rest but um to trust one's tissues to know when one's had enough mm. or when it isn't right and i think most people know intuitively when they're doing something that's fundamentally helpful and when they're not that's yeah it's an interesting point as well because um <clears throat> I think the intuition, I think the work uncovers the intuition. It kind of allows it to come back to the surface once again, where I think a lot of people hold down their intuition. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's that lovely book um, by Sandra Sabatini, which is written about her time with Vanda. I think it's called Like a Flower or something. Like a Flower, and, yeah. It was given to me to read, but I didn't, I hadn't got it. I gave it back to the person that lent it to me. Um, but that sort of wonderful moment of, you know, Vanda's quote going with the body and not against it. One of the elements in that was, well, you know, if you're feeling tired, then you sleep that day or rest. Mm. And if you're feeling that you've got a bit more energy, then you pick your practice up that day. Rather than how some people would say, well, I've got lots of energy. I need to do a calming practice. And if I'm tired, I need to do an energetic, energetic practice. What about going with what the body's really telling you? Mm you know, going with those notions as well. And that, that really works something up for me because as you've heard me say, it's that, and seeing the slideshows, you know, going with the body, not against it. And I then, I relate that to a lot of the anatomical experience. There's also something here about our intuitive 
experience as well. You know, it's so vast in that respect. It is, and it's it's interesting, isn't it, that students will often not often, occasionally students will say, Well, what should I feel? <laughs> what should I feel? And it used to really throw me in the beginning. Well, no, if I go back, back, I would say, oh, well, you should feel it in the hamstrings or you should feel it in the arm or whatever, because it, the, the work that I was teaching in the very beginning was about let's stretch the hamstrings, let's do a trichinasana, let's go into dog pose because it's good for blah, 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 blah. Um, but now I'm more interested in can students learn to listen in and and really hear what their body's telling them so you ask me what should i feel well what do you feel and it's fine if you say i don't feel anything mm. it's a starting point you know you don't feel anything are you sure that you don't feel anything is it not that you can actually feel your feet touching the floor and then is that a key into something else you know, if you notice the touch of your feet on the floor, do you then maybe feel whether the whole foot is touching the floor or not? And does that lead up the back of the leg? Does it lead up the side of the foot around the ankle? Does it lead, you know, follow, 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 and listen. Mm. And um, yeah. beauty comes. Yeah, it, it does. That's, that's true. Beauty does come with that. There's a, there's a beautiful feeling that comes from it. And it's... Um, <laughs> whatever that feeling is you know and it's I, I think a lot of people want the right answer to it you know am I, is, should i be feeling such and such like, or oh, i don't know what you're feeling is what you're feeling um but yeah that, that actually reminds me of when i went through a particular training many many moons ago and there was that sort of deep heavy you know so what are you feeling now and i just said well I'm feeling my bum on the chair right now. You know, that was, I was a bit kind of cheeky with it because it was almost like a, an overfeeling experience for everyone. And that was it for me. And it was almost as if I, I was told that, well, you can't just feel nothing else. I was, well, I can. And if you keep asking me those questions, I'll probably feel a bit agitated. <laughs> you know, it's just feeling that surface is it. And that is likely to be enough in that moment. And there's nothing wrong with that. No. No, and it, I think it's learning to trust ourselves mm. and to be okay with small, with delicate, with subtle. Because I know if I'd come to this yoga when I was much younger, um, if my mum had introduced me to this yoga, I think it's unlikely I would have stuck with it. Mm -hmm. um, because when I was much younger, I needed to move and jump around and feel stuff happening. And as a dancer, everything is so extreme that you are kind of hardwired to feel gross sensations, not to really notice subtle ones. Mm. Um, because if you start to feel every single thing as a dancer, you're going to be in pain. So you kind of subdue it. It's interesting. <clears throat> That's yeah, it's a similar experience in the sort of training life that I had before. It's, it's a lot of sort of feeling out to the edges, you know, that comes from a deep sense. Mm. And I, I, I do think a lot of people that have got that level of physicality about them, you know, you've got that and you've had that as well from your earlier years and the training that you've done. I think we feel it from bone to skin. Mm. It's just that there isn't any time to wallow in those deeper places that we can have a lot of time with now because everything else has got to come together to do what it does. And it's almost to me, it's like the rest of it's already in place. It knows what to do. I just got to make sure I meet these places out here. And if I don't, I'm either going to get injured or things are not going to look right if I'm, say, performing or something like yeah. that. You know, so there's kind of a yang element to it. It's got this sort of element of yin going on. But now we can kind of wallow in a bit more yin and at least be held by the yang. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> totally. <laughs> totally. I mean, I'm, I'm loving the fact that I don't now need to do the splits um, or stand on point or do whatever it is that we used to do um, and that I can be 
what I would have classed as self-indulgent. I mean, maybe people who come to my classes think I am self-indulgent, but I, it feels so good and I don't really care. Um, you know, it's, it's feeding me in a different way. I think Pete is really interesting about this because he says, be really clear about what you're doing when you're doing yoga. Are you doing a performance? In which case, you know, like I would do if I was um, posing for photos for, you know, publicity photos. I'm performing for the camera so that the photograph looks right for whatever it is. Or am I practicing for myself? In which case, if you were filming me, it would probably look very dull indeed. Because um, <laughs> it's all about the feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, if you're performing, it's, it's, <clears throat> you've got to switch off the feeling. Mm. Yeah, I, I did some shit, I did some, uh, I did a shoot for a book, a yoga book, a yoga directory, many, many. I had hair, I think, <clears throat> and it was darker. Um, <laughs> And I remember that whole process of going through these postures and I was sort of approaching a particular pose a certain way and they just said, no, 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 we, we don't want to see that. You know, can you just get to this? You know, they showed me an image of what it would be. That's it. And I was like, oh, okay. So I've just got to be in this particular position and hold it for as long as they want those photographs to be taken. And at some point I'm going, can I get out of this now, please? <laughs> Um, and that was it. And it just, it was a strange experience. I remember thinking, I'm never going to do that again. Mm. Because I don't want to, I don't want to prostitute my work for somebody else's, um, you know, magazine or book just to be in these particular poses. Mm. Saying that now, you probably find me in 10 years time in all these magazines. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, doing the strangest poses. But um, yeah, it was so odd. And I thought, no, this is, this is everything I moved away from you know, to, to then do this, to be in this book, it was a lovely idea at the time because a lot of people got excited about the work and they just heard that, well, there's another yoga teacher in Brighton that is quite well known and get him in it as well. I was like, well, yeah, but that is not what I'm doing this for. Mm. It's about giving that experience across and creating the conditions for other people to understand something about themselves. My practice is my personal practice and no one really interferes with that. It's done behind closed doors, you know. Yeah, and then you'll share it, maybe, if it's relevant. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Diane Long did that. She, um, when she came down to Brighton, she used to teach at my studio a lot and um, would stay at my apartment with me at the time. And um, she would get keys to my studio, go off early and practice before she would teach her a workshop. And there was a couple of people who said, can we come along and watch you practice? So she said, sure, if you think you're going to get anything from it. Um, I could just see your face just going Ooh, like that. Ooh, and yeah. I to go down there to let people in, this, this couple in, as Diane just went about her practice. And they went in to sit and just sit in the corner and watch her practice. And they came out about 20 minutes later, almost slightly embarrassed. And I said, you know, you're OK. And they just said, we, we actually feel like we've just been intruding someone having a really intimate moment, um, you know, because her practice was so deep. Mm. so intimate in the way that she explored it it had sound attached to it because things were happening to her and it didn't look like anything that you could recognize as yoga anymore you know and um, that I, I knew what they would be going through because I've been there when I've had stayed with her sometimes and she'd go about her practice really early in the morning and you know I'd be doing mine in a different corner of the room and every now and again I'd hear this strange noise and look across and <laughs> something's going on for her and she's off somewhere you know yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, my practice is not for consumption. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, very much not. Um, I, I share it, but I share, I don't know. It's just, it's just too much, too much in yeah. to, um, to want somebody else to, to look at it. So do you find then in that inness of your practice that, you know, in, in there are moments that you can pull out a bit of information and that's what we have in our teaching. Yeah. Um, and we talk about this a lot on the teacher training, how it's a kind of a different channel that when I'm practicing, when I'm in my thing, um, I'm in the physical felt sense and there's almost no language. It's, it, it's feeling. And then 
when I'm teaching, when we, when we decide what we're going to teach as teachers, we need to switch into a verbal language. So I need to give you words that you can understand mm -hmm. and that mean something to you and might kind of translate into something approximately similar to what I've been working with in myself but it's a translation it's a different language and the physical felt sense I can't always find words or similes or visuals suggestions that work to get that idea over um, and I have to be okay with the imperfectness of that yeah um, I get that completely and I think that's what's interesting about teaching movement is to be to be really clear about what what's my purpose in teaching these movements. Do I want people to look broadly the same as I do when I do it? Or do I want to give them some suggestions so that they can have an experience which is theirs? Do you find then that there's an interesting correlation between what you might have gone through in dance <clears throat> and the freedom that's expressed within the practice? Because there's elements of dance where, of course, there's lots of conditioning and mm. sort of training for that. But then there's also, so I, I watched a really amazing documentary on, on the formation of jazz last night and, um, you know, jazz dancing and how that's gone from its earlier years into the Lind from the Lindy Hop right the way through to, you know, what we, we know now. And, um, how it's formed itself differently. And you know, the, 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 the expression is free. It kind of finds its own way. The body's finding pathways to explore. Do you find that maybe from your background in dance that that has had a huge influence somewhere? I, in? <clears throat> yeah, I think, I think quite a few things spring out from that in that um, I was watching the Royal Ballet do their they did they put on a two hour performance online a couple of weeks ago and I just managed to start to watch it last night and I thought you know the thing about the dance is it's given me confidence in my body to do things mm. um to do things that I might not otherwise have thought I would dare to do and I'm thinking really ordinary things like you know we've just moved out here to Exmoor and the hills are like this and I went for a walk the other night and literally I had to scramble up the hill on all fours and I was thinking to myself gosh Catherine you know if you hadn't had all of that training and that understanding that your body will support you that it is there and you can use it I probably wouldn't at 55 be scrambling up a hill on all fours, you know, climbing precariously through lots of sheep dung. You really need to know this, didn't you? <laughs> I came back a real sight, but um, it just made me think I am so lucky that I've had that experience because it's made me brave physically, mm -hmm. not fearless, quite brave yeah. and I'm not afraid of pushing myself to do things where I think oh do I think I can do that could I climb that tree yeah of course I could mm. um and it's the same thing in yoga yoga is much easier than than climbing the the hill um <laughs> in some ways because the exertion isn't it doesn't need to be held if you want to come out of something in yoga, you can. If you're clinging on to the side of a tree and you've got to hold on tight, otherwise you're going to fall down the hill, that's a bit different. But um, the thing about, sorry, I, I know I'm going all over the place, but um, when I'm in my yoga practice, what's hard is for me to sustain the attention. So it's a, it's a psychological challenge which is then being combined with my trust of my physical self mm. and this sense of listening that I'm constantly trying to evolve. So I'm 
three pronged, if you like, going in, 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 trusting, listening, and saying, carry on, carry on, don't give up yet. Otherwise, I'd just put everything down and go and have a cup of coffee, or a glass <laughs> of wine, or watch EastEnders or something. <laughs> Well, yeah, the, Sorry, I don't know if that makes any sense at all. No, it does. No, it does. It's, um, the, the, that, I think sometimes for us, our attention to maintain its span, we, we sometimes need to be challenged enough to, to keep the attention on it because, you know, we know how hard it is to take that attention in. And we've seen that with our students, so to keep them in that place. I think there's a challenge as a teacher is, is assisting the student to stay in that place of, attention on what feel attention on the feel of the ground and the ground isn't changing but the body is but then when we're out there hanging onto a tree you know and you've got the elements with you and everything like that and gravity wanting you somewhere and it's like well actually gravity you're not going to have me just yet because i'm going to go that way <laughs> but the attention is it's constant and it has to be adaptive all of the time so i think something for me with the the notion of the practice is it, it just keeps refining adaptability so that as things go on in life and you know you you know that by moving mm -hmm. you know, you've adapted to an environment and shifted and moved to where you are now and then you're adapting again it's really interesting when you said adapting to moving i was thinking of the body moving adapting to moving you know as you move you're all you're constantly adapting aren't you you're constantly feeling into a different space and a different way of being and it's so rich um mm. and you know this you know this as, as well as anyone does it's um Yeah, that's, 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 uh, that is something I do love and I, it, it surprises me every time and, I, and I'm learning that a lot also from the martial arts work that I, I keep working with and with one of my colleagues, Rupert, um, is that everything has to keep adapting to what's going on in front of me, but also, you know, how do we adapt to that environment? I'm pointing over there because that's my window, so I see outside. Um, you know, how do we keep adapting to that? But then when we're on this surface, that doesn't change. So I have to create internal changes. I have to put myself into different positions to generate those internal adaptations. Um, just recently when I was teaching on my course, we, had, we were using a barn. Um, and that was a, a place that the host managed to find to get a bigger space so we could be distanced enough. But it was still hot, so we went outside and we did all the practice outside on the grass. Mm -hmm. And it was not even, you know, that rough grass there and there's rough terrain. And it, it was really interesting to watch the students move that way because all of a sudden, something like Plank or Dog, all four points have got different terrain underneath them. So the information coming into their body is, is multiple rather than being on a surface like this where it's the same information coming through. And some people almost have to try and fake their adaptations because they want it to be different. But outside on an uneven surface, there's so much more information that comes through. Yeah, and it's lovely, isn't it? Barefoot on grass. Mm -hmm. Barefoot on grass is probably my favourite. Um, just because you pick up so much information about the earth and how adaptable your foot feet are. Um, and you know you've been with us in in the immersion course in in Sussex, That's where we <laughs> do exactly that. Go yeah. out and and walk around on the grass because there's lots of lovely different terrains down there. Um, so, that, so tell us about your immersion course then. I mean, you know, how did that come about? What what brought that? Uh, yeah. So the immersion course came about because I'd been teaching this for a few years this in this way and I thought there is nowhere that I could go as a teacher and have my my thoughts and my work kind of um to feel reassured that I'm on the right way on the right path you know I would go to John and work with him um but and that was great 
but there were there wasn't a wider kind of body of of other people doing the same thing and there were other people but scattered around you know um, and I didn't see them very often and I thought as a new teacher I would regularly get people walking out of my class you know two three people every time I taught a class and that's quite difficult to take because you just think oh am I doing something wrong and so I put the, the immersion course together to to provide a place for people for other people who were in the same situation as me to come so we could share ideas and reassure ourselves really that this is worthwhile and even if people do walk out it's because it's not for them and that's okay um so a little bit of networking a little bit of reassurance a little bit of sharing all yeah. of those things it's a really good environment down there as well i mean you know it's, it's always lovely to be involved in teaching on that i know i don't stay over and, and at the venue but um i feel like i come into something that's quite special as it's happening and y you you hold a space really well that's one thing i really love well many things i love about the way that you work and what you do um so i kind of come into something that's been held really well it feels really safe and you know, it gives also gives the group the space to explore the practice, but under really good guidance. I thank you for that, Gary. It's, it touches me a lot. Um, my feeling about that space is that uh, Ros and Derry hold it so well. They are really clear about their boundaries, and that gives us all mm. permission to be relaxed so and the actual place is very special isn't it right on the edge of the of the cliffs almost and in that very special sussex countryside and it, something magic happens there that it hardly ever rains when we go <laughs> it's like it's like i don't know what happens we we do a quick call to god and we say god please don't rain on our week and even when it does rain it usually rains when we're inside the studio so we come out for lunch and we can usually sit in the garden for lunch and it, it's i think there's a combination of place the people who are there the people that come you come which adds a little extra you know something it's a bit of extra interest and then um anil and rebecca come and they they do kirtan on friday night as well so there are visitors there are you know guests and there are the people that hold the space for all of us and it's it's i suppose we've been doing it for so many years now it's it's more familiar yeah. and that makes it easier and freer and, and also from this, you mean you've, you've, you've had a teacher training now. I mean, I know you were involved in other teacher trainings before, um, but you've pulled out your own teacher training, which is relating to, I think it's given you free reign to really explore the work that you want to go into in a bit more mm -hmm. depth. So the in, intelligent yoga teacher training. Um, so tell us about that. How, how did that come about? Because we spoke about this a long time ago, didn't we? When you were playing. Yeah, so, we did. No, it happened because I was working with on the Tri Yoga Teach training, which is a great training course, but it's really big. <laughs> um, we were, I was co teaching with Kate Ellis, I think you know Kate, and we had redesigned the course and we kept on working on it and, and making it better and better and better. And then Kate decided that she wanted to go off and do her own thing. And I thought, okay if I'm going to have to find a different teacher to work with, this is actually a signal to me to go and start a training course that I really want to do with the co-teachers that I really want to work with. So you and Pete were like no brainers. I was just, I thought this is a gift. This is giving me an, an opportunity to rewrite the training completely, which I'd kind of been doing piecemeal as we went along but really focus it on the on the way that I wanted to that I felt was meaningful mm -hmm. um, because 
I wanted us to focus more on anatomy and understanding the body and trusting the body than looking so much into philosophy. Because the Tri Yoga Training Course, they have fantastic philosophy teachers, but I felt the balance was skewed and I wanted it to be a smaller group um, and more condensed because I was finding that we would do a weekend every four weeks and it was getting really tiring because people would work all week, come in, do a weekend and then go back to work and then two weekends, three weekends later, they'd have another weekend where they'd have to do more work. So I thought, okay, let's condense it. So we work really bloody hard now, five days. And then you go off and you take all of that work, which has kind of, kind of squashed into you, hopefully. Um, so you go away, play with it, explore it. We give you some work to, some reading and some other work to explore and some research ideas. And then we come back in three months time and go over it all again and add a bit more. So what we're finding is that it's really now about the exploration and not about not about sort of checking boxes mm. it, it feels a much more individual bespoke kind of course yeah it feels that as well i mean again you know coming in on that it's i'm coming into something <clears throat> that has a particular feel so I, I can feel the quality within the group and the lovely thing about it coming along at certain stages, I, I see their progression. Mm. And the, the progression also in, in how their minds are working as well. Different, different questions start to formulate. Their understandings start to put things together. And, you know, as you know me, my, my, my work is non-linear. It's like mm. scribbling all over a piece of paper. And so you're trying to follow that line. But they somehow they managed to keep up with that as well, which I'm, I'm amazed at um, <laughs> myself because I can't keep up with me. Um, but no, it's great. They, they kind of formulate interesting questions. And I think, it, you know, you give the platform for that again to, to become quite expressive, to understand the confines of practice as a trainee teacher, but to also then have the creative expressiveness around it as well. Uh, that's not an easy job to do. Well done on that. Thank you, Gary. I mean, we couldn't do it without you guys. Um, because you provide a depth and real meat on the bone oh. sorry about the one yeah but you really um we draw the people in and, and we get them to a certain point and then they go to you and you come and you give them so much more and because they're we're very lucky the trainees that seem to be attracted to come on the course are usually much more experienced than they were at Tri Yoga. So we say that they need a, a two year minimum practice, but very often these guys have got 10, 20 years of experience behind them. And it really shows. Yeah. It means that they're there already. And all we're doing is polishing the edges, you know, um, just honing and refining the experience. Yeah. And it pushes us as well pushes us to be better teachers. I think you mentioned last time we were together that all we're doing each time is we're standing on the shoulders of the greats that went before us. So we've learned from um, John. John learned from Vanda. Vanda learned from Iyengar. And, you know, I've learned from you. We're, we're just all the time building, 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 creating extra layers of experience and incorporating that it's like a big family integration, isn't it? Yeah, you know, I learned from my mother who learned from my grandmother. And, and it's, it's that kind of that build and that, that expansion. Yeah. So, um, and that's really important that we acknowledge that, isn't it? I mean, you know, you and I, I see you and I do this anyway. I mean, I, I always make it an important part of my own practice when I'm teaching. All the teachers that have taught me before are in the room with me. Mm. You know, it's, I, I, I'm just an, another way for that information to come out just through me but I, they're always mentioned and I you know I, I hear you do the same and it's 
that's a rarity. You don't see lots of teachers actually do that, respecting their lineages and their pasts. You see a lot of people trying to hang on to the stuff for it being their own. I think it's a lot to do with the culture of um, competition mm -hmm. in the yoga workplace. I don't know whether that's going to change now because of COVID. Um, because it's been interesting to, to move into Zoom mm -hmm. um, and online and to feel that somehow it gives me license to be more, more me. I, because I'm not working in the studios anymore, I don't have to conform to something that the studio people might um, expect. I don't know if that's the truth or whether that's my projection, but um, certainly when I'm online on Zoom, I, I feel like I'm, I'm able to be more me. That's a good <laughs> point, actually. Um, that's a really good point. I mean, I remember when I first set Natural Bodies up, and as you know, it was a gym. Mm. And that was set up by me and my colleague that started it. Uh, another bodybuilder at that time who trained me, Carl Lloyd. And he, he couldn't bear the gym environment anymore because of the, the confines and also the pressure in terms of steroids. So we broke away from that and created this tiny little space where we could then be free to bring about the practices and trainings that we wanted without having to fall in line with uh, a, a methodology from other gym and training type systems. So then, of course, you know, jump forward 20 odd years and then there's natural bodies where it's got the yoga center element. I was always ever teaching from my own space. So it's a bit like, you know, here I am, like you teaching in from your own room. You've got the freedom to do that. And it's only when I started teaching in a couple of health club type environments that I realized I was putting myself in and it, it didn't feel right. So I just had to go with what I could do my way. And it sometimes rub the health club owners up the wrong way with what I might have been delivering. But um, I just thought there's no way I can hold that back. And, you know, you're teaching in your own space. Mm -hmm. You've got the freedom to do what you want. The same with also running your own teacher training. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I feel really blessed. I really do. I feel so blessed that I've been able to, been introduced to all of this stuff right from a kid with, with my mum. And then that I've met the amazing people that I have met along the way, you know, life could have been very different, but I've been blessed with, with um, meeting all of you guys, you Brighton crowd. <laughs> the Brighton boys. <laughs> the Brighton boys, you and Pete and, and, uh, and John, of course. Um, and feel very, very humbled and, and, just so happy that that this has all kind of come together and it works yeah it does work it's beautiful i'm um, also neville cregan who's been teaching on your course as well he's uh, an old brighton boy too yeah and even though yeah. he's one neck of the woods really isn't he he's top now so i know you're not yes. close, but he's closer now to you yeah he is he is we have to go and have a drink at some stage Definitely. So, yeah, you're down in, uh, where's it, Exmoor? Uh, Exmoor. Right? <laughs> Loving every minute of it, huh? Loving every minute of it. Loving the rain, the daily rain. <laughs> we wake up in the morning and uh, do the rain check. <laughs> <laughs> Just to make sure it is raining. Yeah. Just to make sure it's raining, because it wouldn't be Exmoor if it wasn't raining. Um, <clears throat> Yeah. So how does that, you know, how does that feel in you after being in a city for so long and teaching and kind of, you know, negotiating a city and now you walk out your front door and you're not on the street the same way? You know, well, I certainly was, <laughs> I certainly was not climbing up sheer rocky outcrops with sheep looking at me, <laughs> pooing down the front of my jacket. Um, no, I think the one thing that I really noticed about moving out here is the sight lines. Living in London, you come out the front door, and I was talking to your wife, Sharon, about this the other day, and I noticed that when I sit here and I look out the window, I can see across the valley and my eyes can rest on the horizon. 
and in London, that's very unusual. And I didn't really notice it until now. Until now that I can do that. I can sit in the office upstairs and look along the horizon and watch the buzzards. And it makes me feel so much more close to nature. Um, and I suppose that the yoga is evolving because of that. Um, because I'm doing a lot more physical work outside. So when I do my practice, it really is about the yoga. Yeah. It's about increasingly, purely soothing my nervous system. That is it. Because I, I don't need to do yoga for exercise because I'm walking up cardiac hill outside. <laughs> but uh, that's interesting. That is interesting. I mean, I, you know, as, as you know, we're down here in Brighton again and um, being down by the sea, I have to get there every day because I, I need to land on the horizon with my eyes. And that's always been a really important part to me. Um, and not to have that is, is weird. It's a strange feeling. Yeah. I mean, I loved London. I really did. No. Um, but I'm and you, you were the one. One of the ones, when Rob had his heart attack and we went out for a drink, do you remember you said to me, I wonder that you haven't thought about getting out of town. And it had been a little seed and then you said that and it dropped in. You know, there's, there's seeds, there's moments, there's things that happen and they just layer up and make more and more clear suggestions, like little pathways. Well done for doing that. Thank you. Well done to you too, getting out to your seaside. Yeah. So Catherine, how do people find you? Or do they, where, where do they connect with you? So really easy, it's my name. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine Annis Yoga. Um, come to the website and uh, yeah, that's, okay. where, that's where it all is. At the end of this and I'll put information for the um yoga teacher training as well at the end oh. of this interview as well so people will know where to find you and when's this coming out gary um it will be out within the next week or so cool so if people are watching it they can come to our workshop then can't they yes they can they can our workshop with uh, howard oh, yes. who was my teacher back in the day fantastic okay well i'll get this out sooner if i can <laughs> great fabulous brilliant so thank you catherine Thank you, Gary. Great talking to you. It's a shame we can't, because we're so used to being around each other sometimes when we do stuff like this. But um, Hug. Hug. Virtual hug. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my love. Very nice to chat. Bye.